you made the case that math is realist but anti-objective. Yes. I want to go to your book, Morality and Mathematics, in that you've said, I have argued that the case for moral and mathematical realism is surprisingly parallel. Our mathematical beliefs have no better claim to being self-evident, provable, plausible, or analytic than our moral beliefs. Nor do our mathematical beliefs have better claim to being empirically justified than our moral beliefs. It is also incorrect that reflection on the genealogy of the moral beliefs undermines them, while reflection on the genealogy of our mathematical beliefs does not. What is true is that our moral beliefs are contingent in a worrying way and this may disqualify them from counting as safe, realistically construed. However, exactly the same thing is true of our mathematical beliefs. So contrary to the majority of the quotations that began this book, if one is a moral anti-realist on the basis of any such epistemological considerations, then one ought to be a mathematical anti-realist as well. We spoke about making the case for math being realist, but also not objective. Mm -hmm. But I just want you to linger on this coupling between the two, this parallelism that you're trying to draw. This last line, if one is a moral anti-realist, then one ought to be a mathematical anti-realist as well. Why do they walk hand in hand? If you make the case that maths is anti-realist, then how do you make the case that morality is also anti-realist? Yeah, good. So just to be clear about the, the, the uh, uh, as, you, as you set this up, um, right, so the, the book is a little bit strange because it says, um, it says that, you know, people have traditionally thought ethics and math are so different and so on. And all of the book until chapter six is actually, they're really, really similar. And all the differences that come immediately to mind, like in math, you can prove things and in ethics, you can't prove things like math, you know, applies to the physical world and ethics doesn't like, you know, evolution explains our ethical beliefs, but not our math, you know, so, so on and so forth. Um, those turn out, I, I claim, I argue, not to be significant differences or not differences at all. Um, however, in the in the final chapter, I say there is a difference, and that's this thing about deliberation and objectivity that we can come back to. So let's set aside the deliberation objectivity thing and just talk about okay. what you might call like companions and guilt, right? <laughs> this this idea that, you know, certainly cuts against um what I think is the the tenor, not just of philosophical discussion, but I think if you ask, as you said earlier, anybody on the street or a typical scientist or whatever, and the quote and the book begins with just all these quotes from, you know, famous people of all kinds saying, saying exactly this. So, so how do you get the case that, that if you're an anti, what, what I think you're asking is if you're an anti-realist about ethics on the basis of epistemological arguments, you got to be an anti-realist about math too. Exactly. Right. So the answer is you go one by one through the arguments and you see whether you can make the case equally in the mathematical case. So we can we can talk about all of them or some of them. But, you know, let let me give some illustration. So I think a very natural place to start when you're wondering, like, you know, that's that sure sounds like a quacky thing to say uh, is to think about proof and uh, and the, the different methodologies. So, I mean, Certainly, superficially, math seems totally different than ethics. You know, in math class, you, somebody lectures to you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a right answer. Uh, in in ethics class, it starts with debate. You know, so so it's extremely natural to be like, "What are you talking about?" Like they, these are totally different things. But you gotta again, sort of look under the hood a little bit and return to these issues that as I say, uh, brought me to philosophy, these questions that people like Russell and Frege and the founders of analytic philosophy and, and logic uh, took the time to make precise, which is, what do you mean by proof? What do you mean by axiom? And there's, there's, a, there's a mismatch in the projects of ethics and math that makes it very hard to compare at first pass, which is on better epistemological footing. Epistemology for people who aren't up on the lingo just means the theory of knowledge. So like better footing when it comes to like sort of intellectual credentials. Yep. And, um, and here's the difference in, in ethics, we're at first pass trying to figure out just what's categorically the case. Should you give to charity or not? In math, what we're trying to figure out at first pass is what follows from some axioms. So, you know, if you want to know whether every vector space has a basis, 
are you really trying to figure out whether period every vector space has a basis or rather whether you can prove that from the axioms that your teacher taught you that you never even took a day to discuss? Yeah. In fact, I'm already over intellectualizing how math actually goes. As anyone who actually studies math will know, it's very rare to even be exposed to the axioms of math once in your life. In class itself, I mean, you might on your own decide to read about ZFC set theory, but it's not normal to take a course in set theory. It's not normal to take a course in logic. And it's not ab abnormal to not even know what, say, the axiom of replacement is. Why is that? Um, th so there are different explanations for this, and I'll tell you the one that I think is the right one rather than give you all of them. I think the reason is... Um, because it's turned out to be productive to prove theorems where what I mean by that is establish what follows from what. And you want a common corral, a common framework from which to prove the theorems. And so once we came up with a, fr a framework in which most of the things people wanted to prove could be proved, and the people who had thought about it a lot seemed to like them okay. And the rivals were not obviously better than the candidates. Yeah. The best policy was just to, you know, assume those as background assumptions and start teaching students um, things that presuppose them without argument. Because another way to put it is you would never prove any theorems in the logical sense, figuring out what follows from what if you first had to settle what axioms are true, because you then turn math into philosophy. Okay. This is something that people don't realize, but there are debates about the axioms. They happen in philosophy departments mostly, but but it's not like the debates went away. They got quarantined. It's just like the foundations of physics in this way. You were you mentioned the wave function and like, what is it is a, is a representation. Yeah. What's the right interpretation of quantum mechanics? That makes it sound like it's like, you know, how to interpret a fiction book or something. But these different interpretations give different theoretical predictions. So they're not they're not just wordplay. I mean, yeah. the GRW theory makes a different prediction in terms of collapse than the Copenhagen interpretation, Bohmian interpretation and so forth. That's inequality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so um, so so similarly. The foundations of physics, there are these questions about fundamentals, but they got quarantined. Because a certain methodology of just using the Schrodinger equation or, or in the case of quantum field theory, it's the Heisenberg picture, I guess, that's used more often. But using these mathematical instruments reliably and now even getting technological benefits potentially with quantum computing. Um, I mean, obviously, we've got a million technological uh, benefits otherwise from quantum mechanics, but I mean, specifically with these foundational matters about collapse of the wave function, you know, leave it to the philosophers. And so so there's become this segregation in academia for better or worse. I'm not claiming actually this is a bad thing necessarily. I think division of cognitive labor is sometimes a very good thing. There can be no denying that in a sense in a certain sense of progress, math has made enormous progress in the 20th century. But it's not the sense that Russell was after. And that's why Russell famously says, I think this is in uh, his intellectual autobiography, he said, you know, I, I, I wanted certainty so bad. And, and I thought math is the best place to find it. And so I did what I could with Alfred North Whitehead to, to find it, to found all of math on logic so there could be no doubts. And I, dis I discovered that it's just turtles all the way down. And so I left philosophy of math. And it's a very interesting thing about, about Russell's biography, right? I mean, he's, he's a beautiful writer, as you illustrated already. He also is one of the greatest logicians of the 20th century. And he gave up logic early in his <laughs> career. He never did logic again. He eventually contacted Goodall about his theorem, and he, didn't clear, he clearly didn't understand the first thing about it. I mean, the question was just so confused. He was like, should we think that one plus, you know, one equals zero or something? Um, because he just, he thought, look, I like math because I like certainty. And actually, it turns out math is not the land of certainty. So back to your question, like, why has math decided to focus on what it's focused on? And you don't have to worry about axioms and you can be a brilliant mathematician and not even know what the schema of replacement says or or what the compactness theorem in metal logic is or whatever. It's because that project, the project of proving theorems from axioms, which for better or worse, they're just the ones that 
you know, the contingent evolution of the set theoretic um, enterprise landed on um, has turned out to be very productive in some respects. It's just not the respects of the of the people who are worried about the foundations of math because it hasn't settled any of those debates. It hasn't, for example, given us certainty in the sense that Russell wanted. You know, people are familiar maybe with, you know, Gödel's second incompleteness theorem that, you know, if if a theory like piano arithmetic is consistent, then it can't prove that it's consistent. Now, the relevance of that and stuff is very much you can dispute it. But, you know, there's all these just limited results. And meanwhile, what do you do? And there are two things you can do. You can do philosophy of math and keep thinking about these issues or you can sort of move on. And the mathematical community has kind of moved on in exactly the way the physics community moved on with the problems to do with um, uh, the Einstein. But how do you move on if you haven't like established the foundations? Like if this is analogous to a building, you're saying like the foundations are still up for debate, Yeah. but for a matter of convenience and productivity, we've just moved on to the next layer, even though there's so much debate. Like, to me now, you said you're not making a case whether this is for better or worse, but I think, like right. you just think intuitively, you need to focus all your efforts and resources into securing the foundational beliefs, and then you can build up like a bottom yeah. up approach. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, this is a totally, I think, defensible point of view, but I, I do want <laughs> to, I do want to be fair to, you know, the mathematical community and the sort of sort of pragmatists. Sure. Um, and and I think a one view among the pragmatists and both the foundations of physics and um and the foundations of math is kind of like it is it, it turns on just a general criticism of philosophy um now i think the criticism of philosophy is confused and that's why i don't endorse this point of view but here's what i think they would say look philosophy doesn't make any progress we can make progress <laughs> on the other hand doing this other thing so let's do the other thing now Kind of like with the word proof, progress is a very ambiguous word. And I think that's doing all the work when you disambiguate what you can mean by progress. Well, it makes progress in one sense, not in another. And, you know, depends on what you care about. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember even how that. (laughs) uh, I'm to blame. I took us down this road, but we were ultimately talking about making the parallel case between mathematics and morality. And then we got into the world. of. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I can, if you want, if you want me to go through the other parallels, I'm happy to, but you know, this is, as you can see, it's, 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 there's a lot to be said. So we were talking about parallels in particular, you know, why does the fact that math has proof and ethics doesn't show that there's a lack of parallel? And the answer is, well, you're being ambiguous with the word proof. We, we do have proofs in the logical sense of ethics too. You can formalize different ethical theories and prove what follows from them. People do that. It's called deontic logic. But that doesn't that doesn't settle anything about whether I really ought to kill the one to save the five or something. Right. Because it depends on what axioms are true. And the point is that in ethics, we're not content to just be like, okay, let's use these axioms. 